che ha ideato, sviluppato e realizzato questa rete e in realtà da alcuni anni. Abbiamo pensato di fare, io faccio una breve introduzione, vi dico un po' quella che è la mia esperienza scarsissima, eh, dovuta non tanto alla, alla mancanza di indicazioni o perché io non credo all'unità di questa rete, anzi, ma perché eh, in questo caso purtroppo io lavoro in Emilia Romagna, anzi in Romagna, e come tutti sapete abbiamo delle limitazioni importanti per quello che riguarda eh, non solo l'attività privata ma anche l'attività pubblica, eh, se le lenti non sono acquisite in una camera eh, regionale diventa una lente di impresa, riuscire a comandare di fuori di queste e per cui le lenti come queste qui vanno acquisite eh, a persona e con richiesta quindi personale. Eh, e giustificando le varie volte, per quella che è talmente difficile riuscire a ottenere che non riesce a fare dei grossi numeri, neanche se avresti intenzione di, 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 di utilizzarne un po' di più. E la rete, come ho detto, è stata ideata nel 2007, quindi sono già più di 15 anni che viene utilizzata, e l'idea iniziale era quella di ehm, utilizzare questa lente ed on, quindi era una sorta di quelle che erano le lenti di Dimè, e um, per risolvere quelli che erano i problemi restrittivi residui dopo un intervento di catarata con lente nel sacco. E, um, poi quindi questa è entrata con una lente molto focale. Da lì poi sono invece state introdotte eh, un'altra varietà di, di surplus perché oggi è disponibile anche la torica, ma che è diventata poi anche un modo per risolvere non solo un difetto refrattivo, ma per aggiungere una multifocalità eh, su una lente monofocale per sentimenti incantati, quindi oggi è disponibile anche nelle forme trifocali eh, torica e eh, non torica. Eh, la lente è disegnata in modo da cercare di ovviare a quelli che erano i potenziali problemi delle lenti piccole del passato e in particolar modo a il disegno, vedete che è più o meno simile a quello di una Rai, una Rai One normale, eh, simile ma non uguale perché eh, il, la dimensione del piano è più grande, di 6 mm e mezzo e questo per cercare di evitare problemi di blocco, di pillare, di apertura, di pillare della lente e ha ah, queste anse che vedete che hanno una forma eh, ondulata eh, questo per cercare di avere una maggiore stabilità eh, della lente che è impiantata nel, nel solco e è di materiale idrofilico il che la rende particolarmente maneggevole infatti da un punto di vista eh, della difficoltà tecnica dell'impianto direi che è veramente provvisorio perché è molto semplice impiantarla e poi ha un'altra caratteristica che le applicazioni sono inclinate di 10 gradi questo per eh, fare in modo che non ci sia un contatto continuo eh, della lente con eh, il liquido in modo da non avere dispersione di giovimento e quindi potenziare problemi di perpensione giovane nel posto per l'anonimus. Eh, qui e qua sono brevemente riassunte queste caratteristiche, io vado molto veloce perché poi il professor Ramon invece eh, avrà modo di fare una presentazione eh, molto più completa ovviamente di questa. E, L'altra caratteristica interessante è che il piatto della lente ha una forma concava su un lato che va ad appoggiare sulla lente precedentemente impiantata e questo in modo da non avere un contatto diretto in modo da ridurre la possibilità che si possa formare delle, una proliferazione cellulare nell'interfaccia che può portare ad una eh, iperventopia non preventivata eh, nel preoperatorio, nel post operatorio. Questo è un caso che ho fatto recentemente, così per solo per così come fonte di discussione eh, più tardi, eh, si trattava di un caso diciamo, tecnicamente più semplice rispetto ad altri, cioè eh, una persona che tra l'altro in molti per me, eh, nel primo occhio che è stato calato sul sinistro, che era pure un occhio di e ha anche una degenerazione macular seminatrofica con una lesione pseudo-uniforme centrale, e mh, partiva da una situazione di più 5. Eh, il calcolo della IOR guidava una lente per ottenere le, le metropie di 28 diotrie, l'equipe chirurgica ha eh, erroneamente impiantato una lente da più 20 e quindi nel posto operatorio ci siamo ritrovati ad avere nuovamente una frazione di più 5. E quindi in questo caso eh, l'idea era quella o un evitare di dover schiantare e impiantare la lente, di impiantare una sulcoflex, in questo caso monofocale. E, Abbiamo impiantato una lente da più 8, eh, nella scelta del potere della lente eh, non sono stato arrivato dai nostri specialist della Lina, che sono sempre molto disponibili, molto bravi, molto professionali, e 
Non ci sarà veramente neanche faccio, è molto semplice perché si tratta di fare un'apertura del 2 2 e si mettono pochi gli scolasti, lo si trova con spazi sul tuo libro, insomma, ma tecnicamente veramente non c'è nessuna difficoltà. E vedete che eh, già una settimana dall'intervento eh, abbiamo ottenuto una refrazione che è praticamente naturale, sarà meglio comunque da 0,50, ma direi che insomma, il risultato refrattivo è stato assolutamente ottenuto. E io a questo punto lascio la parola al professor Lano, poi avremo spazio per chi vuole avere altre informazioni, domande, chiarimenti, insomma, eh, siamo qui a posto. Grazie. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm very happy that I'm here in Italy. I always like to travel to Italy and to these beautiful cities. Thank you to Reina that you invited me. Um, I'm going to give you first uh, an overview on the development and the history of the South of Exchange and I hope it will become interactive afterwards so then we can discuss special problems and uh, everything. Everybody is invited to, 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 to talk with us and, and to discuss this topic. Yes. So, in our progress is always a, a different kind of a herb. We all have a, a, a uh, you don't have a linear advance, it's always a big back draws and then you create a new thing. And I think one of these steps was the creation of add-on lenses, because with that lenses we can solve different problems. The history of polytriophic or piggyback lenses was in the early 90s. At that time, the surgeons implanted two biconvex lenses into the capsular bag. But this in, in cases of high hyperopia or myopia, so in order to come close to hemotropia. Uh, the problem is, there are different problems. One problem is if you bring both lenses into the bag, there are these lens epithelial cells, and they grow into the interface. And when they grow into the interface, you can't treat it very well, you can't get it. You have to remove your first lens, and then you are hemotropic again. So this is one of the problems. The second problem is, if you have two biconvex lenses, you get contact between the lenses and they flatten. And when they flatten, you have a hyperopic focus. So the refraction is not exact. And the third, as you all know, with sharpness lenses, they may rub the iris, you may have pigment dispersion, inflammation, and so on. So you have to have a specially designed lens in order to overcome these problems. So this is the history of the sharpness lens. In the late 90s, I had this idea that I thought if you put the lens into the surface, there should be an interventricular opacification and you could overcome this anatomic, this refractive surprises. At that time, my memory was not that good and we often had problems taking to exchange the lens, telling the patient you have to wear glasses and so on. So for that reason, I thought only for anatomic, it would be a good idea to do that. And then I approached Rayner in the, it was 2000, and it took four years until we had the first prototype. And in 2007, I planted the first subflex on an amyotropic pseudofake patient. So it was a secondary implantation. At that time, MPR was not that difficult. It was more easy to do that. And I, you see it on the, on the, on the, the picture of this patient. This was my first time I was a patient with um, with uh, a bad result uh, of uh, biometry, and then I implanted the first Arcotex in 2007. So we have now a follow-up of about 17 years. So this is quite a time. And later on, we created the idea that not only for biometrical surprises, we can do that, we can also do it in toric versions, we also can do multifocal versions, and we also can do a duet procedure, which means we do the cataract, implant the lens into the bed, and on top we put the multifocal lens in order to have the patient uh, uh, spectacle independent. So we need an optimized alert design if we want to implant the lens secondarily, so when the pseudofacus is all red in the eye, or if we want to perform a real procedure. It is important that you have a good material. And it could show in the 90s that hydrophilic material has a higher UVL biocompatibility. And this lens is in contact to UVL tissue in the surface, so to vascularize tissue. And because of that, I think it really is important that this lens is made of hydrophilic acrylic and not of hydrophobic acrylic. The second thing is you need 
a different optic shape. You need a, a large optic. This optic is 6.5 millimeters in order to, to cover the first lens, which is usually 6 millimeters. And you need a concave bolster surface so that it don't have this contact and the flattening of the lenses and no high optic defaults. And the haptic should be larger because the sample is a different diameter than the lens and it is only in order to overcome some rotation. But I will tell you later what I think about the rotation. So there are different options now. You have monofocals, you have multifocals, you have toric, and you have a combination of multifocal and toric lenses. To give an overview, I also have to tell you that there are two different other companies producing add-on lenses right now. That's the crystal lens, the subreflex, you know, we are talking about them, and the first few lens, which have a different shape, uh, but they're all of hydrophilic material. The exotic, some exotic lenses on the market, I think in the middle you see this Morka lens, which has a stenotape hole inside, which increases the depth of focus. This lens, unfortunately, well, MDR is not available easily. You have to write a prescription for the patient. This is quite interesting for irregular stigmatism correction or something like that. But it's a rare case, I would say. And there's a pathway use so of other lenses. Some people use the ICL. And I think that's not a good idea to use the ICL for a, myo, uh, for a uh, biometric surprise because it's unwritten anteriorly. It has a hole in the center. That's okay with faking patients. It's a nice lens for faking patients, but not pseudo faking patients if we have a specially designed lens for that purpose, not ICL. I think that's not a good idea in that case. The surgery. Yeah, I have a little calculation for doing procedure is straightforward. You do your biometry and you calculate and then you just put this first lens in the back in order to have the patient mainly endotrop. Some special cases maybe you go for minus, but usually you go for endotrop here. And then you put a multiple lens on top with zero correction for far and you have the edge for 1.75 for intermediate in the travel case and for 3.5 diopters for the year. The ILL calculation for secondary implantation, when you have a biomedical surprise, is straightforward and easy. You don't have to measure the you don't have to do a biometric, you just try to get the exact cerebral equivalent. And if this cerebral equivalent is within 7 diopters, you just have to multiply the cerebral equivalent with 1.5 in hyperopia and with 1.2 in myopia. And that's straightforward. And then you have a, a diopter. And then you use this diopter and put it in. Here now you see a dual procedure, a, a standard dual procedure. In that case, it was a, a toric monofocal lens I put into the bag. You have to remove the viscoelastic from behind before you implant the sun. So I, I do it like this. So first I remove the viscoelastic from the capsular bag. Then I again instill some viscoelastic behind the iris to lift the iris. And here you see this lens is very soft and opening very slowly and gently and very controlled. Then you remove the viscoelastic from the interface and from the anterior part. And then you have usually a very nice result with a tribal lens on top. This is a dual procedure. And here you see uh, an amyotropic patient with a biometrical surprise. Here you see the folding procedure. You have here this, this it's important that the optic edge is behind these, uh, the edges of, of the, the folding device. You close, and it's important that the trailing haptic is ideally on top of the optic so that you don't interact it during the pressure, pressing forward. And then here again, I I slowly inject the lens, try that the bleeding happy is behind the iris so that I'm in the right position and not in the back definitely. And then I rotate the lens in. Usually I go 90 degrees between the happy of the back lens and the happy of the sutures lens. I think it is more, it is better, it has more space than for, for the implantation. Again, removal of the risk elastic. And you see there is some other category, and I would suggest to do the yak caps not only afterwards, but you definitely can also implant these lens in yak situations. But if you have the choice, I do it later.
the results are just, I, I will go through this in a fast mode. We did some cadaver eye studies, they showed that the position of the lens is, 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 is nice, they have a concentration, and the minimum contact period is only in the periphery, definitely, where the okay, haptic is, is located. That's an important slide, I think, that Heidelberg group showed on eye bank studies and, and in vitro studies that the optical performance of two lenses with the eye are almost the same as one lens. So if you put the trifocal lens into the bag, you get the same straight ratio. There's no significant difference as compared to two lenses in time. So the optical quality is the same, even though there are four surfaces in the eye. Here again, they could show that. And the, the transmission is even better as compared, for instance, to a, a bag lens with glycerin that auto sometimes has. So they compared auto to the dual procedure, monofocals, and they could show that the transmittance is even better as compared to some other lenses on the market. So optical problems, similar and no, no adverse reaction. As I told you, I have now an, an over, uh, a follow-up of 200 lenses for 17 years. And you see here in the UVM that there is an, usually there is a nice distance between the iris and the anterior surface of the lens. It's the lower picture. And you also see the OCT, the anterior, that uh, there is a distance between the two lenses and there's no contact in the central area. The periphery sometimes has some contact. It has to be like that. That's not a big problem. And the lens, I forgot to tell, is angulated posteriorly. So it's important that you don't bring it in upside down, definitely. You will get some pillar or something. So bring it in the, in the right position. You have to be angulated posteriorly. Here there is a toric study. This was a study uh, where we realized that there is some rotation. That's one of the, the slight disadvantages. Because as you bring this lens not in the back, but the, the bag is closing and holding the lens in position usually, this lens may rotate. And we have a rotation and the literature shows the same results in about 10%. So you have to know that if you do a drawing correction, it's a very nice tool for other PKP or whatsoever. If you have a change in the in the torus, you have to know that sometimes these lenses are rotating. If that happens, you may suture it. I usually then take one haptic out and suture just one haptic with a 10 over lead suture and on one position. It hasn't to be very strong and holding the lens tightly, it just has to, to, to keep the lens in the right position. That's, you have to consider that. Yeah. So this is one point I want to mention. I think Torek is fine if we have add-on with some of that lenses, but you have to know that they may I did not do some crunching techniques for that. I don't suture it with the knot. And I, I, I wanted and had to mention that if you are interested in flunging, I, 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 I wrote a book last year about flunging technique. So maybe in Springer, uh, you, can, you can find that some, some tips for that. That was interesting. The centration, we did a study where we measured the centration of the capsular bag lens and compared it to the centration of the surface lens would be the same eye. And there we could show that uh, the Sarkis lens had a slightly significant better centration than the capsular bag lens. And this centration stays because there is no contraction of the capsular bag or whatsoever. The Sarkis lens stays in the Sarkis and there is no change. Different with the capsular bag. So the dual implantation, maybe some more words about the evolution of multi-local lenses and diode lenses. It's interesting that in the 80s, some here heroic surgeons cut two lenses into pieces and glued them and they brought it into the eye. So they had bifocals within the eye in the 80s. This was some kind of crazy maybe and it didn't really succeed. But nevertheless, in the late 80s, there was a first diaphragmic lens on the market. It was a 3M lens, which was made of PMMA. They had to open the, the eye very widely and they had some uh, in 
induce asynchronism, so it didn't work. So we had to wait until we had both focal lenses. And then, uh, in the early 2000s, the diagram with bifocal lenses were on the market, and 2007, the first add-on multifocal refractive lens was on the market. And since 2014, we have uh, this adult light expression, either of what we have different other optical uh, systems for creating some kind of near vision. So, maybe I, I just want to mention that. In theory, you can bring all these optical principles on a, an add-on lens. So we had already the refractive bifocal side lens, but we changed to the trifocal diffractive lens because well, it has a, a, a better on the MTF curves to see that there is more light on uh, the focus if you use a diffractive system as compared to the refractive system. But there are pros and cons for both the systems. I mentioned that uh, this uh, lens with the center bay core also helps. It's another principle where we can increase the depth of focus with a center bay core, with a pinhole. Uh, and we definitely have the now made called monoplus or either of lenses with you using the achromatic aberration, which principally can be also used on an add-on lens. You also can do a monovision or mini monovision, as sometimes do with, with add-on lenses. If you do a monovision and the, the patient accepts it, you, have in, you can take it out easily, and then the patient is again amyotropic or myopic or whatsoever. So you can, I don't want to say play around, but you have a lot of options with the patient, and that's one of the main advantages. You can remove that lens, and show you a video later on. Easily. It's very easy to remove that lens from the surface to a small incision, and so I would say it's a reversible procedure, especially with this kind of tribal lenses that have no failure and papers and so on. So, here you see about uh, the, the bifocal refractive lenses, which is on the right side. You have about this kind of visual ability for your near vision, and the diffractive trifocal one is on the other side, on the right side. You have an intermediate focus uh, here again. So we did a study and we published it in the, the orange where we compared on one eye the trifocal, ray one trifocal lens, on the other eye the duet trifocal lens, and we couldn't see any difference with the key focus, any significant difference, and with uh, uh, in our follow-up. So the secondary enhancement, you also can in principle implant a trifocal lens on top of a monofocal lens. The good thing is, if there is some residual amyotropia, you also can correct that. So you don't need to use a zero trifocal lens, you can use a 0.25 trifocal lens because these lenses are also available in quarter steps, not only in half quarter. So you can really exactly bring the patient to amyotropia, amyotropia and have the end. One problem, you have to consider this if the patient has a very good vision and is monofocal. So he is used to have a very good contrast and not too much care. If you bring a trifocal lens in, he first will have uh, to have halos because all multifocal lenses, no matter which one, creates halos. That's, that's physics, that's all. So he will change, he will have a change in, 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 the, in his appearance, the appearance and the, oh, he has the advantage of Glass independence, spectacle independence, but he has, you have to tell that he has a halos and he will have some reduction of the of contrast. That's, that's all. Yeah. You have to tell the patient. But uh, there was a multi center study with several centers, and that was quite interesting to see that they compared the contrast before implantation in a, in a two a monofocal lens and then implanted the lens. And then we compare it afterwards. And in photographic conditions, we didn't find any significant difference in contrast. A little bit lower, but not so much. In mesopic conditions, there was some difference. So if we have a dim light or something like that, you might have a different contrast as compared to before when you have only the monofocal. But that's, as I mentioned already, that's, that's unavailable. It, it has to be like that. And the patients in the, on the questionnaire were quite happy with it. So what are the indications of subject lenses? 
In your procedure, so in primary implantation, you can overcome the very high anatropia. If you have the plus 40 lens, you can use a 30 diopter lens, I sometimes do like this, and then I put the 10 diopter lens on top of the surface to, to, to correct the patient. The same is with toric. You also can add a toric lens on top if it's a very high astigmatism. And definitely the main indication is multifocal work. So if I have a patient who wants spectacle independence and I want to go for a triple lens, I always, in all my cases, not because I'm the waiter, but I think it's, it's, it's reasonable, I go for in effect, monofocal lens, and I put the trifocal on because I never know what happens. Maybe, and hopefully, it stays in the eye. And it's, uh, but I have two patients who I removed it, and the patient was in the topic afterwards and was happy. So, so I like to have this step back opportunity. Yeah. So for me, uh, this is the main indication for good procedure: trifocal lens implantation in a kind of subduction. And secondary implantation, definitely the main thing is the correction of the refractive surprise. And even if we have the best biometry, sometimes we are not exactly. And sometimes something happens as you have that some surgeons use the, the, the wrong lens or whatsoever. Or that the labeling is wrong. So you, it's so easy to make the patient in trophic. And when I now do a, a, a discuss with the patient where he wants to end up after surgery, I'm very easy going because I can tell the patient, you will become an entropic. In 95%, but if not, I can make an entropic. Because then I just put the correction. <laughs> there are also some specific indications in a dynamic refraction where you have a change of refraction. For instance, this child that did that eight years ago, mm -hmm. on the left side, you see the implantation of was congenital cataract, and the cataract with the photorexic after vitrectomy implanted the lens in the bag and a sarcophex on top. And five years later, the, the patient, the small boy, had a refractive uh, shift, a myopic shift. And then I did the exchange, this is on the, on the left side, this is here, who to see on the right side. Um, so I, I explanted the lens and put a different lens on top, not only explanting it, exchanging it so that the patient could stay in an almost emetropic uh, situation all over his uh, development period. Or, 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 and so, yeah. So in conclusion, uh, we have the option of fine tuning. So we can really come to zero of which refraction we want. Uh, we may specifically select the lens we bring into the bed. You can use a hydrophobic lens, hydrophilic lens, you can use a toric lens, you can use a, an aspheric lens, so we can combine, combine the, 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 the situation. The main thing be it is a reversible procedure. And we sometimes in cases of body phenomenon with problems, you sometimes have an early exploitation, but it's very rare. And also, there's also an argument for, for this fluid procedure. Later on, when you, you do a clear lens extraction on a patient with 28 years, we never know what happens in 30 years. If it becomes a diabetes, if it becomes an EMP, and if you want to have a better uh, contrast, we can explain this lens 40 years later. So I have a patient, I did the first lens 15 years ago, and he had de developed an AID, and I, I discussed it with the patient and explained the lens in order to increase his uh, contrast. So we also can step back later on. So we have the option to, to bring the patient to monofocality if there is a need to or if we want to. So here you see an exploitation, it's not often that happens, but you see here I, I just, it's 2.4 millimeter incision, I just go in with the forceps, an implantation forceps, and that's now an exploitation forceps, and just pull it out, because the lens rolls itself, you don't have to fold it, you don't have to cut it, you just take it and pull it out. This is almost reversible, I would say. So, let's take home message. The optical quality is almost ident identical to single 
trifocal aberrance, but it is reversible. And the main indications again, multiple word implantation and in specific patients, multiple enhancement or a correction of a biomedical surprise. Thank you very much. E se avete domande, eh, abbiamo un buon quarto d'ora per poter rispondere alle vostre, vostre dubbi. La prima cosa che mi è andata in mente, perché ci siamo incontrati ieri, ne abbiamo parlato ieri, è che nonostante il, eh, aver visto il disegno della lente com'è, teoricamente è disegnato in modo da non avere spostamenti, invece eh, il professore Anno mi diceva ieri sera che eh, la percentuale di occhi che hanno visto un impianto di eh, sulcoflex storica si può spostare nel posto operatorio e, e la, il fatto è che la differenza delle poche impiantate nel sacco che hanno generalmente possibilità di muoversi solo nei, nei, direi nei primi giorni del posto operatorio qui la rotazione può venire anche alcuni mesi dopo eh, e nonostante tutti gli accorgimenti possibili è uno dei possibili eh, Così, delle possibili complicazioni della lente e eh, come dicevo prima tecnicamente la lente è facilmente impiantabile ma se c'è poi da tenere da cercare di fissare una torica eh, all'iride eh, comincia a diventare una manovra che non è più probabilmente semplicissima e hanno sempre nel caso di essere diventato parte eh, potential issue of the rotation del posto operativo di rotation of the torica sul complex that can occur not only in the short time ma posto operativo in short time but in the long time, so you have to be yeah. very careful in the follow-up of this type of patients. That's right, that's right. It, it can happen four months later. You never know when it happens. Usually it doesn't happen, right? You just have to stay, yeah? But I had some patients where there was a rotation three months later, which would not happen in a backhand statement. So in the beginning, I just re-rotated it then, but those cases where this lens rotates, and especially on that axis where you want to have it, they would, well, the chance is very high that they will re-rotate again. So I did it, it was easy, just rotate it, with there's no baggage, just do it. But two weeks later, the patient came back and said, now I have vision again, re-rotation. So in that case, now I do, as I mentioned, I, I, I do a station with this, with this future. Extension where? Sphere, sphere, sphere. And you have this sphere of fixation on the axis. Yeah. And then it says that yeah, then you never have a rotation. It's a little bit tricky, maybe if you're not used to this kind of, of surgery, but with a spatular needle and the protein suture, it's not so, so difficult. You mark the axis where you want to pick it. It's not always the same axis as the portals, because you, you pick you, you suture at the end of the haptic. And the, the torus is not at the end, it's on the axilla of the axis of the, the optic. But but it's it's working nicely. It works if you if you but I think it's important that you know that because I was very disappointed in the very beginning because I thought <coughs> that they, there's nothing that happens, they have to be slash, there are inflations, they will stay. Ten percent is not set. But you can overcome the problem. And mainly, I don't need uh, toric lenses, mainly I need spheric lenses or tripod lenses. And if I had a patient who I wanted to do a procedure with, a, uh, with, a asigma, with, with an asigmatism, I bring a toric lens into the bed first and bring a spheric tripod lens. So then I can overcome this problem. Uh, toric lens, uh, how large must be the gap on the corner? Uh, this was 2.4 millimeters. 2.4. and it's much more. Very good. It rolls, it rolls, it folds. And it's very soft. Yes, it's, it's very soft. I have a feeling, and very thin. It's, it's concave and it's no diameter on it, usually. Five or six diameters. Very thin and it's open. Qualcuno di voi l'ha già usato? E sta usando? Ne messe con. Abbastanza del numero di anni, no? Ti hai trovato nel messo delle retoriche? No, ho sempre corretto lo spettacolo con la mente del sacro e eh, l'ho usato su una mente come impianto. 
Mi persona in cui non avevo la certezza che neanche un avvocato fosse tollerato, mi teneva la possibilità di rimuovere. Non è mai rimosso. Ti sei più sicuramente del clima più unico, la storia di e il nuovo estivo, e di specie, la storia di questo, 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 la It depends on the situation, yeah. But if you have, oh, I did last week, I did a patient, minus eight, clear lens extraction, young patient, 48 or something, yeah. I did one eye, multifocal, trifocal, do it. Looks very nice, good vision, but she is, has a perfect inner vision on her left eye, on her not operated eye. She was, so she is complaining because she says, i read much better on the normal operating line. Definitely. She has, there has to be like this. So maybe it would be better to on the same time. Sometimes I do. Or at least, let's say, one or two days later. You should have it very short to get. Cataract is more easy, definitely. They are happy anyway. If they have cataract, they are happy. But in clear lens, you shouldn't have too much time in between because the patient will, you know, And that's sometimes a little bit tricky. So you can choose whatever you want, but my suggestion is to do it very in a short time during the difference. To do it in a difference is, is, is quite is reasonable because if in the first time you have some anitropia, you can easily co correct that on the second line. And if it's really a significant anitropia, you even could exchange during the second surgery, exchange the arguments. It, 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 yeah. But do it in a short time period of difference. You, you have some uh, block uh, and uh, block uh, One was uh, admitted to us because there was a block and then I realized when I did the surgery I wanted to expand it, it was upside down. Okay. If you have upside down, You might get a ball. Otherwise, you won't get a ball. It's been, it's angulated posteriorly. Sometimes you get some pigment on the gland surface, sometimes, in rare cases. In my thinking, I think it's not a big problem, but that is to be considered sometimes. So you, you, you do not consider the the, the, the chair chamber, the death or no, 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 no. I did it in children with. I length, axial length of 15 millimeters. So even if the anterior chamber depth is very low, I think it's, it's, it's not a problem. Usually then, the lens is very fit. You, you, you remove the lens, the pseudofagus is one sixth of uh, the normal lens, so there's space enough. So you have, you have only to be aware to uh, uh, have problems with the the area or have to be upside down. Yes, that's absolutely important, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's easy to see. It, it opens slowly and there are long haptics, they, they go behind and then you see that it's in the right direction. Yeah. If you're into uh, the human optic lens, for instance, it has four loops and there sometimes it's not so easy to see if it's upside down or not. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's important, but it's easy. Thank you. How many uh, contemporary procedures do you do? I mean, it's, a, it's your first choice. It is my first choice. It is my first choice, but I'm very critical in choosing the patient. So I don't do so many uh, trifocal lenses, but when I do trifocal lenses, all this dual procedure, and I would say I do it uh, two a week or something like that. The main advantage, not I won, but it will be the, the, the main advantage of the work procedure when you say to try to try to the lens and the second lens is the very speedy because in any way I do not I do not find any more advantage because you have two black lenses, there's not one. The only advantage thing is that the reversibility. Absolutely right. The only thing is the same. The advantage is the reversibility. And the surgery takes, let's say, two minutes say longer. Two minutes. <coughs> Uh, 
I've seen that uh, you have a very long uh, ethics. Uh, do you have some particular attentions uh, uh, during the implementation, uh, for example, uh, in the um, actor, uh, the, the ethics? Uh, um, where do you put uh, before to implant uh, the, the lens so inside? When you fold in the injector, yes. I always try to the, the trailing haptic, the haptic behind, I put on the optic. Okay. Okay. When I fold the optic, when, when I close the injector, okay. I do the, the haptic trade on the optic of the lens and then I close. Okay. Because otherwise, sometimes it would stick backwards. Yes. You, you would override it and you can in trap it. You bring it in front, okay. on the optic, or at least close to the optic, then it does not happen. Yeah. That's okay. important. So when you close, you must not entrap some habit, or even the, the, the leading habit. It should look others in between the, the closing system. But if you have a resistance during the, if you press the plunger, it will <laughs> some high resistance and just stop. But usually if you do pull it exactly, you, it goes smoothly. And you go ahead. Uh, when I went, uh, I put the lens and then uh, a little come back, then I return. You understand? Oh, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yes. no, I not maybe it was overriding once, and it will maybe go right yeah. again. So maybe you should open and look again how the lens is, is inside the, the, the folding device. Yeah. But it's important that the haptics are on the opening, oh. at least the trading gun. And the other one is not looking upwards, but is in this. Instead, and in the eye, the Swiss elastic that in the bit, these haptics are very, very soft. So they open, even sometimes they stay, and only if you remove the Swiss elastic, they will unfold. Yeah. So it's easy to bring these haptics, these long haptics, behind the iris. You can rotate it or, or just push them behind the iris. Okay. Hey, so Ringrazio il professor Landon per essere stati con noi oggi e, e grazie a Rainer Italia che ha dato il supporto. Buona giornata a tutti. Grazie. 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 Thank you. Thank you.